Thank you for that introduction. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on here in Canberra and also to say Nina Mani to you, which is welcome in the language of the Ghana people in Adelaide. Um, my name is Robin Carmody, as I've already said. I'm a visual arts educator. I'm actually in between schools at the moment. I was at Blackfriars Priory School and I'm moving to Prince Alfred College this year. Uh, I'm, I feel very honoured to be presenting to you here today and I'm uh, also really excited to see so many of you here on the last day in one of the last sessions. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about an, implementation, uh, an intervention that I implemented with Year 7 and 8 students in my visual arts class that was driven by evidence-based teaching practices with the aim to develop their drawing practice and their independent learning skills. Uh, this is just a little outline for my session. I'm going to start with giving you a rationale for why I chose to do this. And I'll briefly outline the school context. I'll talk about the research evidence that I chose, why I chose it, and how it shaped the intervention. And I'll detail the particulars of the activity and then I'll talk about what actually happened. Best laid plans and all that. And then summarise with what I changed and where I'm going to go in the future with it. So I started with a clinical teaching question. This is actually the short version. Um, so the question was, can middle school, I mean, you can read that. So I'm really looking at visual arts students in middle school particularly, can they improve their individual drawing practice using personal learning goals combined with quality feedback supported by a clear assessment criteria over a period of eight weeks? So why, you're asking. Why is she doing this? So as a lot of these projects are, it started as a uni assignment. Um, as a part of my studies in uh, Master of Clinical Teaching through Melbourne University, which has a very strong focus on um, the clinical teaching cycle using evidence-based practices. And to give you an idea, we affectionately amongst ourselves call it the Hattie degree. Um, I'll just leave that there. And. Uh, <laughs> I've lost myself in my notes now, and the subject was called learning from evidence, but that was the starting point, and 
I just had to create the project and then I implemented it and it, then it just it took on a life of its own. I, I, I did this as opposed to a whole lot of other projects I could have done because I was increasingly frustrated with students in year seven and eight who switched off in art and believe that they're not artistic. This frustration combined with my, you know, my further studies really forced me to thoroughly examine my own um, teaching philosophy, particularly as it relates to visual arts um, and middle school students. And I asked myself, what is it that I want for my students when they walk out of my door at the end of the semester? What do I want them to have gained? And it wasn't about curriculum and it wasn't, about, it wasn't even about skills. And I realised that what I want for them is I want them to have to get this right, I want them all, every single student, to experience that genuine pride in the creation of something that they've made with their own hands from their own ideas, not my ideas, and I want them to not chuck it in the bin at the end of the task. Thank you, I was hoping I'd get nods there. And I want them to take it home and show it to their parents or the people that are important to them and say, I made this, I created this, and I don't care well, I kind of care, but I don't care if they're not going to pick art again in year 9, 10, 11 and 12. I want them all to have that experience and I get increasingly frustrated with students and parents who say, oh, you know, my son, sorry, and I'll use, I'll, I often say boys because I teach all boys. He's not artistic, he's more sporty and I just think that's absolute rubbish. We're all artistic, um, we all have that and I wanted them to experience that. Completely gone off my notes then. Um, sorry. So I, uh, I'll just move on. All right. So the, and I, so I really wanted to them to build that self-efficacy and belief in their, um, their own abilities. So just a brief um, bit of information about the context. Um, it's an R, which is reception, which is kindergarten or the first year level before year one. R to 12 boys, Catholic school. Um, all year seven and eight teachers currently had a visual arts homework program, but we all approached it incredibly differently. Um, and, but we all agreed that we wanted to assess the development of skills. And the frustration I had with that was that if you have, you know, you get your students' first dr homework drawing back and you give it 10 out of 10, where do they go from there? Like, they're like, oh, I've, I've done it. Don't need to do my homework again next week. Um, and just, uh, I'm, we're reporting to the Australian curriculum and at my school we had been reporting to the Australian curriculum for the last five years, but I'm also particularly interested in the personal and social capability. The research, such fun researching, evidence-based practices. So what I realised is that um, you can't just pick one evidence-based teaching practice to guide the, the intervention it quickly became obvious to me that I needed to choose. I actually ended up with three, which is probably too many, but um, I needed to reach, research these thoroughly. And I'm not going to go through these a whole lot. If this is interesting for you, I did print 10 copies of <laughs> the short version of my paper that you're more than welcome and to look at. And if you're interested, there's some um, references there as well. Um, but I was particularly looking at goal setting, mastery goals that are smart, specific, measurable, ambitious, results oriented and timely, but also I wanted them to be students that the goals that the students learnt to set themselves. Quality feedback. Feedback is a really, really interesting evidence-based practice because feedback can be effective or it can be detrimental, depending on how you give it. So if a student gives you their work and you go, excellent, well done. What's that student going to do with that? They might think, well, that sucks. You know, like, I, I want to know, I don't think it's any good. I want to know what to do next. So looking at the, the model that I looked up was, um, it's a brilliant paper by Hattie and Timperley. Uh, it was a model of feed up, feedback, feed forward. Um, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, how are you going with that? And what do you have to do next to reach that? And then assessment. Now, I'm, I'm quite passionate about assessment and learning progressions. And if you are too, 
we'll, have, we'll create a support group. Um, but I'll talk about assessment in the next slide, but I can highly recommend this book. This has become one of my favourite books, which probably says something a little bit about me. Um, and it, you know, you can read it in your, at your leisure. It talks about what I'm going to just put up on the next slide, which is a criterion reference framework. Now, this is, this is, a, bit, um, this is a bit full on, uh, but essentially what we're looking at here is um, it, it's an assessment rubric. So from now on, I'm going to call it an assessment rubric. Um, and the progression of the skill, it's, uh, so it's column based. So I don't normally use A, B, C, D, which really pisses off my students. But I just put that on there to try and explain this a little bit more to you. So the basic premise of this is that you start with your capabilities. So I've drawn these capabilities and they are along the bottom. So I've drawn them, you'll recognise them from the Australian curriculum. Uh, visual arts and also the personal social uh, personal capability you know what I mean and but then for each of those capabilities you create learning indicators so yeah okay I want my students to do this but what is it that they can actually do say make or write to show me that they've met that capability so it's one thing to say yeah so I want my students to solve creative problems yeah okay that's great but what are they going to do to show you that they have solved a creative program. And that's, that's the hard part when you're writing these and you pull your hair out because also then from there, you develop the progression of skill. So at the lowest level, solving creative problem, what have they done? And I'm thinking about the students who come to you with their, their homework and they go, oh, miss, because they were calling this miss, it's shit, sorry for swearing but that's what they say. And you go, oh, okay, so what were you trying to achieve? Oh, I was trying to draw a face. And so I identified that the first thing that they might want to improve, the first step for them was to identify a broad area of improvement. Oh, the eyes suck. <laughs> you know, you know, you've all heard this from students. So, okay, so what's specifically about the eyes? So, um, so this, this is the, assessment framework that I developed based on uh, the work that I've done at uni and based on the learning that I've gained from this book. So I, could, I can talk about this for ages, so I'm just going to do with the clicker gone. <laughs> okay. So what, this is an outline of the intervention. So what actually was it? So basically all it was was, it was a homework booklet. And I introduced it to the students. Um, I had, uh, the first time I did it, I chose a learning goal for them, it was portraiture, loads of fun, and the, uh, made sure the students understand the process. The students complete a drawing homework each week with a reflection based on those questions, those Hattie Timperley questions based on feed up, feedback, feed forward. And, and I set aside a lesson each week where they would hand in their homework, the students would work quietly while I worked one on one with every individual student, you're starting to see where it could go wrong. Um, and I would work with them and I'd give them some feedback while I was giving them that feedback. So that rubric that I just had, I used the same rubric every week and I coloured it in with a different colour every week. And that's, that's a genuine one and you can tell because it's not prettily coloured in. And then as it went on, students were encouraged to set their own learning goals. So what happened? So, you know how you plan things and then you use it with a class of students and it... Uh, no, it did... So, talk firstly about the ways that it worked. Um, when students understood the process, they were confident to choose a goal and had sufficient literacy to complete the reflection, it worked really, really well. And this is a student who just wanted to draw eyes, you know, and, and he started, he was... You can see his literacy at year seven is really great. Um, and he was able to do that each week and it was fantastic. And something that um, Sandra said earlier that really resonated with me was that if, if students don't have the literacy or, or the language or the confidence, then they can't access this. And that was one of the challenges. That's on my next slide. Um, also, uh, that's the same student over eight weeks. I know, it's like one of my successful ones. <laughs> that's why I picked it. So, um, 
Also, where it worked was when the feedback was in person and in writing, and it was timely. So when it was in that lesson once a week, the kid gave me the work. If I took that away and then gave it back to them, no, didn't work. You know that. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this again. This is an example of one where um, you can see the first week. So I'll talk a little bit now about the challenges. The biggest challenge that I didn't anticipate, because I did a lot of research at the beginning, like I looked at assessment data, I looked at the NAPLAN data and ACER, and that was fabulous. And, um, and I also surveyed the students and asked them, what, what do you want to be assessed on? And they overwhelmingly said, we want to be individually assessed on the development of our skill, but they really, really struggled with getting no evidence shown for their first drawing. And they'd be like in tears because Sorry, but they're boys. I'm like, oh my god. Um, and I failed. It's like, no, and getting it across to them that there was going to be one grade at the end. So if they did the world's best drawing, but they didn't improve every week, then they couldn't pass. Whereas if they did a really shabby drawing and then they could show me improvement, then they could get an A. And that's, that took a long time to, for them to grasp. Oh, they didn't, they didn't, then they didn't really get that, yeah. <laughs> so, um, some of the challenges, uh, after the first semester, um, sorry, I've gone too forward too far, oh no, I haven't, no, um, the students overwhelmingly gave me feedback that they wanted to choose their own topic, they didn't want me to say, okay, we're going to do portraiture, they wanted to choose, which was great, it led to greatly increased student involvement, but it came with its own problems. Um, cho students choosing appropriate top <laughs> topics. I had a lot of guns. That's up in the top right. Um, and then I said, well, I don't know if you want to draw guns. They said, you said we could choose. I want to draw guns. So, okay. And then I had one boy, uh, oh, sorry, I wanted to talk about this student here. This was um, really interesting because this boy had cerebral palsy and he just didn't think that he could engage. So we decided that his goal was going to be, in uh, collaboration with his OT, was going to be drawing um, small shapes. And that's my writing, so I scribed his responses and that would take me, so that was a beautiful kid, uh, takes me to the next one, which was some of the challenges where, uh, you know, we've got more weapons. Um, this one was really interesting because Long, after a long time, we realised that actually what he wanted, his goal was to create a scary drawing. So it wasn't, it was something completely different. This was another challenge, this boy just drew a soccer ball every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one up the top was um, the boy with cerebral palsy in the second term. So the second time we did it, mm -hmm, yes, no. So his mum, that's all I need to say, isn't it? Uh, and so that was some of, uh, this was year seven, yeah, so, uh, it, oh, <laughs> okay, so what I wanted to talk about uh, really quickly, this, so the boy who drew a soccer ball every week, what we started doing, because it was a really challenging class, and it, no way were they going to work quietly while I sat one-on-one -on -one with them, like, what was I thinking? So there was, like, shit going down, I'm like, okay, so the, the way I dealt with it was, um, I said, right, okay, oh, come on. Um, the big table in the middle, everyone were putting everyone's drawings out. And I did a bit of, and that was just the best thing that could have happened because we spent the whole lesson giving the feedback to each other and we started that group dialogue, which was, and I started to model that process. And this is the boy who did the soccer ball every week for the first time. Now he hates, oh, I'm just, I'm so proud of this boy. He hates art. He's not going to do it in the future. He's really, like, he loves soccer. He just wanted to draw soccer stuff. But he wanted to draw a turtle. And he, each week, and I hardly helped him because he didn't really like me very much either. So, um, but he went, and you can see, you know, he's gone, oh, I, I need to learn about the patterns, and I need to do this, and I need to do this here. And, and I'm really proud of that, more so than the boy with the eyes, because he's already a good student. I'm, you know, am I really helping him, or am I just giving... Where, I was really proud of this one. Um, those of you who teach senior students will recognise that this is exactly what we do with Year 11 and 12s, 
and you might be sitting there going, yeah, 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 I do this. And I know, because I do it too, but remember that these are 12 and 13 year olds, and what they're learning, um, uh, they've not chosen to do the art, they, they have to be in the class, they're learning about their learning, and they're starting to develop the skills that we need, we expect them to have in year 11 and 12. And also they can take these skills into other areas. Okay, what did I do? What did I change? So I did this over three semesters and after every semester I went, whoa, okay, I need to change this. And every semester I changed the booklet. I spent a lot more time at every stage, a lot more time at the beginning of the task explaining it. Time spent each week on explicitly teaching the goal setting skills and the um, critical thinking skills, I didn't, I spent hardly any time teaching drawing. YouTube can do that. Like I'm, I can't believe I just said that, but oh, I really want to learn how to draw a pattern on a turtle. Well, I'm not going to teach you how to do that. Go look it up. I'm going to teach you how to reflect on your work. That's what I saw as being the most. I also treated non-submission as part of the learning process and didn't just like, Okay, so what's getting in the way of you doing your homework and how can we work with that? Um, involving students in the feedback process and giving greater student choice worked really well. My conclusions, I'm going I'm to be dead on. Was it successful? Well, what I learned is that educational research is extremely messy and difficult and it takes a really, really long time. So my conclusions are that really I have none um, because I don't have enough data. Like, I just simply don't have enough data. And I changed it every semester. I, I you know, it's not, um, <laughs> however, um, initial results are promising. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased with some things. Of course, some students didn't, you know, and they still think that I'm a complete lunatic. The research is sound, and the problem for me was in the implementation. I needed to keep going back to the research. Implementation can be tricky. Future directions, well, I mean, I'm not at that school anymore and I'm not teaching your sevens and eights. Um, so future directions for me are continuing my passion with developing a progression of school for the personal and social capability because I really feel strongly that we expect students to be able to reflect critically and then we don't teach them how to do it. And um, I think that's really important because often we can't do it either. Um, very quickly, this is what the booklet looked like. So that's the front page. Um, and then I had the, on the next page was the assessment. Um, I always give them a uh, vocab sheet and I make it colour coded because I think that's really important. And then I had tips for success, I gave them some ideas and then I also gave them just some ideas for some strategies that they might use. And then I just made one, you know, that's the page you draw on and this is I, you can see, again, I've changed the questions because some kids wrote like an essay every week, weirdos. And thank you for listening. Today, my presentation is about a study that I'm conducting. Um, it is about group dialogue and questioning strategies for the engagement of students in learning about artworks. Uh, I have plenty of opportunities uh, to see teachers teaching, uh, especially in service teachers, that is my students, and also some, uh, some free service teachers. Um, sometimes I find um, quite problematic quite problematic is that uh, the talk of students, uh, especially in the first 15 or 30 minutes, focusing on learning about artworks. To provide you a context of the uh, primary school setting Hong Kong, uh, we have around 25 to 35 students in the class with one teacher, and uh, usually the class lasts for one hour and 10 minutes, and then usually the teacher will spend around 
half an hour to talk about artworks, and then they start uh, to art making. So the problem is that in that first half an hour, um, I noticed I noticed that teachers talk a lot. They really talk a lot. Sometimes they ask questions, but uh, they give up very easily if they cannot find any response or the response is not good. So my 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 intention is how can I improve these fifteen to thirty minutes of talking about our work with students? How can we engage students more to to look, to observe, uh, to ponder, or uh, to uh, to speculate, or to to interpret or to make judgment? So that's the purpose of this study. Okay, uh, in this part, uh, this presentation, uh, there are three parts. The first will be a review of models of criticism, teaching, and learning. The second part is the framework and a propose of uh, dialogue and questioning strategies. And then I look at the results of the study after the first iteration. Uh, just like the previous uh, presenter is still, still uh, in the implementation stage, so I just collect the data this morning. So, uh, very, very hot. Okay, okay uh, this part will be very quick. I think uh, you can find certainly uh, many familiar names here. For example, Fallon, uh, the four stages of criticism. Uh, the ten models for ways in questioning framework, uh, Keith Higgins, uh, in private based activism learning from DBAE, and Yenny Wang's uh, visual uh, thinking strategies, uh, which I learned a lot uh, in the yesterday's workshop. Okay, so this part will be very quick. So, before I have this study, I would like to ask myself what are the current literature or work, the current theories about. Uh, Having a dialogue with students in the classroom in the museum. So I go to these uh, theorists. Okay, for Feynman, uh, the four stages of criticism, description, formal analysis, interpretation, evaluation, and judgment. We are very familiar with that. Bell um, is an uh, early childhood educator. So she proposed uh, to ask seven types of questions, including looking questions, perceptual descriptive questions. Analytical questions, storytelling questions, which is um, especially suitable for very young kids. Uh, contextual questions, interactive dream question. It's a kind of question that uh, you ask when you also engage students in some making activities. Evaluative question. And then take more than four way thing, also very popular among American teachers. Uh, looking artworks in a museum from a personal approach. Uh, looking at the object, looking at the subject, and looking at the context. Uh, Wolf and Huggins in Private Based Activism Learning is coming from the DBAE. Um, they try to engage students in three types of activities, including personal response activities, aesthetic concepts, and skill acquisition activities, and student research activities. The other one special thinking strategy is um, uh, they ask three basic questions, or fundamental questions. Uh, in front of any work. What's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And what more can we find? And Voitry, Voitry is a philosopher. Uh, he published a paper in 2014. Um, he asked more than 100 questions uh, to interrogate painting. There are, in these following six dimensions, uh, painting as a physical object, parenting to place, the painter's elements, Representation, theory, evaluation, aftermath, it is um, what happened after you see this painting. And finally, it is Hilbert's uh, three most of dialogues in museums. Uh, uh, she's an American uh, professor. Uh, she proposed um, three types of dialogue predetermined dialogue, interpretative, thematic dialogue, and interpretative open dialogue. It really depends on the structureness and the openness of dialogue. Okay. So, uh, have a very quick look of all these theories and or models. You see there are certain overlapping, for example, about elements, about uh, interpretation. Uh, so I try to synthesize all these theories and models and propose one dialogue or questioning framework that I will use with my uh, participants. OK, I'm going to illustrate um, the, uh, this uh, framework using the work from uh, the for Media, the Millmate. Okay, so you have a good look and try to memorize some of the things you see first here. Okay. 
Now the first dimension that I would propose is about personal connection. Its aim is to motivate viewers to respond in a personal way and reflect on the viewing experience. So the teachers have to guide um, the viewers to talk about the personal experience, value their feeling. For example, in this work, we may ask, um, do you have any experience working in the kitchen by yourselves or with your mother? And do you have any domestic helper? In Hong Kong, quite a lot of families have domestic helpers, which is probably not here. So they have that kind of experience. That will be a good start uh, to initiate the conversation with the students. You try to relate um, what they see to their personal experience. The second dimension we are very familiar with is object description. Um, the aim is to engage viewers to observe and describe the work in details. Uh, try, for example, try to observe and describe systematically from left to right, top to bottom, front to back. I think teachers are um, quite good in doing this, uh, especially um, if you know, for example, family's model. So we can ask, for example, what's on the table? Uh, what are these things used for? Uh, I strongly encourage uh, my uh, teachers to provide more visual stimulus uh, when they talk about artworks. Don't just project the artwork in the classroom, try to give them more visual images or reference. So these are some of the things that uh, actual things you can find on the table. Or do you realize there's something you have missed it in the painting? What is that? It is a food stove. It is a food stove. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. So uh, try to find out some pictures that illustrate the real food stove look like so they can speculate, oh, what, what is that? Uh, why, why, why is that here? Uh, what is the use? All the kind of questions. And then, sorry, it will be visual analysis. Visual analysis, uh, analysis uh, yeah, it should be this, this one, okay. Visual analysis I mentioned. So this visual analysis, the aim is to help viewers to consider uh, the work's formal qualities, use of materials and creative process. Uh, teachers try to help students to find out the visual logic supported by observation and description. At this stage, or during this kind of dialogue, um, perhaps certain of teaching, certain type of teaching is required. Um, talk about what uh, colors, uh, what are the uh, exact knowledge and concepts that they have to know about this work. Example, how would you describe the texture of the maze face? You may have a look at this. So these are the four four women uh, uh, depicted in the paintings of the mirror, but compare this. Okay, you can find a difference. The texture is really different. So uh, if you just if you just ask students to talk, can you see, can you tell me what is what are the texture of the face of the maid, they, they it will be difficult. But try to provide some hints, some stimulus for them and provide a, a contrast that they can know. Of course, there are a lot of explanations why uh, this image is painted in this way. Okay. So uh, these kind of uh, analysis uh, images may be useful, or sometimes you just make it, for example, you enlarge or you provide details uh, of the way the Vermeer uh, tries to vary the tonal effect, so it has to make a very sculptural uh, a look of the May uh, by uh, varying the, the, the dark and the, the bright tone. So these are the visual analysis questions. And then the context question. The aim is to direct viewers to attend to the various contexts that the work is created and appreciated. Um, also, uh, perhaps a little bit of um, searching is needed uh, for contextual information that can be done by the teacher, by the students, or provided by the teacher. Example, does the work tell you anything about the time or the place that the work was created? Do you know the artist? Here are some of the examples, you can show them close. Um, and this is very interesting. This is an art painting by uh, the Lear, the Little Street. Surprisingly, you can find very similar architecture nowadays. You can see the green rubbish bin. They're still contemporary. So I'm not sure whether it's good or not, but it's very interesting. Almost the same. 
or you can provide them some links uh, to for them for further reading or further viewing. This is a this is a film, uh, per viewing. Okay. And the fifth dimension is interpretation. The aim is to develop uh, viewers' understanding the meaning, value, and message of the work. Uh, this kind of interpretation should be based on the work with appropriate reasoning. Uh, for example, why did the artist choose to depict the moment of pouring milk? There are many plenty homework, I mean housework inside, but why? Okay. Um, when you have a look at these images, they are all women uh, pouring something out from a jug. It may be milk, it may be wine, it may be water. Uh, this has to do about contextual research, is that it is a kind of virtue, a symbol, it symbolizes a kind of virtue called a temporary acts. It's always, always very new to me. It means a personal constraint. So don't pour, don't pour too much, maybe just a little. So it is temperate, I don't know. <laughs> we have to check. And then, have you noticed the tiles, uh, the, 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 um, the tiles uh, at the foot of the, of the wall? They are cubic. What does it stand for? What does it mean? So another interpretation uh, is that Perhaps this maid is not a kind of housewife uh, virtue civilization. It is more a sexual object, uh, a design, uh, uh, a design of, from, of men. So these paintings can illustrate um, women in the kitchen, an object of a design. So these are the interpretation questions. And then uh, the judgment. Um, the aim is to let viewers to form an evaluation of the work. Uh, compare works of similar style, nature, type of artist, or we may ask, for example, which part of work they like most and why. These are some of the paintings that, or artwork that we can compare with and to both students to compare. Okay? So these are the framework. And I'll talk about the study then. Now, the study of the aim is to field test and refine the framework. Um, it is more action, uh, action learning research. So. Uh, refining and improving the framework is very important. To investigate the effectiveness of the framework and to evaluate the impact on the outcomes of using the framework. The participants include seven primary Hong Kong schools, uh, one key teacher participant and one or two teacher, uh, team teacher participants from each school. So altogether, 14 teacher participants. And uh, there are 25 to 31 primary school students from each school. So altogether, 160 student participants. Uh, uh, it is seven classes there, okay? The method I use uh, is called design-based research. It is more like an action learning research. Uh, the focus I think, is on the process. So at the beginning of the research, uh, there are some workshops for teachers introducing uh, the framework, introducing the concepts behind, introducing how this can be realized into actual teaching. So there are free workshops for teachers. And then they go back to, um, to their own school and begin to try to practice it. So uh, I have made use of five iterations. Actually, they, they implement uh, for the whole school year. I just uh, have a, a record of three, three times, three, uh, three in schools and two in museums, so as, so as to achieve a more accurate understanding. Uh, during the course of the study, we also have face-to-face -face, um, uh, consultation I advise on the dialogue plans and the performance are rated by independent raters, not by me. Okay? So the data collection analysis, including observations and video recordings from museum visits and classroom teaching, interviews with participating students and teachers, audio records of teachers' reflect, style reflection, and also examine the dialogue plans developed by them. So these are some of the pictures. Uh, some of, sorry. Okay, it doesn't matter. Just skip it. Okay. <laughs> can, how, how can I move back? Okay, it's just, uh, just uh, uh, the pictures, it's okay. No. Okay, now let's have a look of the... Is it? It's shrink a little. I don't know how to how can make it. But it doesn't matter. You can see as long as you can see the way it's time. So, um, before, uh, be, I mean before the workshop, we have a baseline observation. The percentage of engaged dialogue questioning uh, it is, it is, it is a distribution. You can see all the seven teachers ask 
395 questions. And they mostly focus on visual analysis and object description, which is really understanding because we are trained as visual architects. So we talk a lot about visual analysis. Uh, very, very few questions on um, very few questions on uh, personal connection and judgment. Okay, that's this, um, the first iteration. It means the first round. The number of questions asked has increased to 60, 666, not a number, but uh, increased around 70 percent, 70 percent. You can see the distribution is more even, uh, but I think it is, uh, there's no need for, to achieve an even distribution because sometimes uh, you ask some questions more and some questions uh, fewer, okay? But it has, uh, in general, a so more even distribution. And then the performance. Now, uh, we have uh, four rectors, they are divided into two groups. Uh, each rector uh, observes the video and the text of the uh, transcription of the, of the lessons. They give marks on each dimension, uh, one to six marks. So the pretext, I mean the baseline, baseline uh, uh, observation is that it's around uh, two to three to four. Okay, you can see the difference uh, in, in, in different dimensions. And for this uh, first round iteration, that is the results I received this morning. Uh, very interesting, mostly increased, but the yellow one, visual analysis dropped. I have to I have to go home and try and see what 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 happened. But this is research. Sometimes something unexpected happened. But in general, it improved in some areas quite a lot. For example, judgment and personal connection. But I think the quantitative data is not the most important. More more important is the qualitative data or the improvement or refinements that are obtained during the course of the implementation of the study. Um, the first one is that uh, originally my design is set to seven to seven dimensions. If you look at the abstract of the of the handbook, you, you see seven. But I changed it to six because uh, I removed the narrative dimension. The narrative that no, 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 <laughs> what happened? Not enough power. That narrative dimension, um, because it is quite difficult for for the teachers, uh, for the teachers to 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 ask. And it is also more related to very young, thank you, my way, it doesn't matter, for very, for very young, it, 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 it's okay now, yeah. yes, yes, it's okay now, for very young children, okay, and I think also the narrative dimension can be incorporated into the context or the uh, interpretation dimension, so I changed from seven to six, and I also clarified, um, uh, I mean the delineation of each dimension, uh, also refine the implement status strategy. For example, at the beginning, students, uh, the teachers are very eager to try to uh, follow it by step by step. But I say it is not this way. You can ask any questions any time. There is not a there's, they are not in a logical sequence. Um, and also, you may ask some teachers, uh, you may ask some questions more, uh, depending on the nature of the artwork. So uh, that's some of the changes. And also identify some limitations and strengths of the framework. Uh, for example, um, some teachers find it very, very difficult to do it within half an hour if you're going to very deep into one work. Because I encourage them to try not to spend a time on too many hours. Maybe one to three is okay, is fine. But they say if I have to go across to go through all the six types of questions, it's very time consuming. Another limitation is that because, um, I mean, the structure of the, co the, the class is that usually they start with the art criticism and then art making. They have to, I mean, to relate to each other. So they also have some difficulties in um, asking too many contextual interpretation questions. They would like to focus more on the visual one because afterwards they're going to work on an artwork. So there are also some limitations. But in general, they find um, it's good, they have more time uh, to research on the artwork, so that's why it's improved, it is expected. And also, they find it um, useful to talk in certain kinds of direction uh, without leaving any kind of questions. Okay, so that's my risk. that's the end. Uh, just time, right? <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. That's well just done. be careful. Not Magic to touch. touch don't touch that. Yeah. I'm going to go and get some batteries anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm just going to get this to work, hopefully. Yep. So, you may feel like you are quite sensitive to the needs of students and feel the need to offer an alternative uh, to what is being presented to them in school as it is now. You might feel that you would need to go out on a limb or bring, uh, to bring your ideas to fruition. You might feel like you're a bit of a lone ranger. Being brave does require some gumption and when you are wanting to follow your gut without uh, proven results and while flying in the face of um, convention the conventionalism of a certain few, uh, brave is what you'll need to be. Brave is still to turn up to school every day uh, with non-compliant and disengaged students and perhaps also staff members. Perhaps others uh, do not find your ideas or ways worthwhile, um, or at least you sense that. Um, but it could, uh, but if only you can, uh, could get it off the ground, others could see how your ideas could engage students and create positive school-wide uh, culture. This talk is about engaging integrated students who have challenging behaviours uh, in mainstream integrated classes, but. These ideas could stretch over to other areas um, that we may be involved in as well. Uh, here is an example of a disengaged student, and I'm sure you know them quite well. So this student comes in noisy, is louder than all the others, um, needs to talk to someone across the room uh, while you're trying to talk to the class. Uh, they might have every excuse to be talking and make it hard for others to learn, of course. They might be swearing at you. They might, um, they might walk out of your class. They might need to go and see someone in, in a class in, down the hallway, or they might be walking around the school trying not to be noticed, that sort of thing. So I've had a lot of those students. I'm sure you have too. Um, and they are always very interesting to be involved in, with. <laughs> um, so, challenging the use of our time and expertise and energy level, these students are just not engaged. And some students just don't want to be there. It's true. So, in class, in a class consisting of anywhere between 18 to 29 students, where students range from being okay with school to somewhat totally disengaged, Students in the latter category hold what I find is the key to educational success. Um, and this can be so also for the small amount of students that actually want to be there. Um, so as a teacher, I find that I need to be brave in order to find and produce successful and engaging learning uh, opportunities for these students. But equally, the students must also be brave. And there is a reason why they are no longer engaged uh, in schoolwork. That's not how not, not usually. <laughs> there is also a way around that and recognising this will unlock answers for you and your students. Uh, it is in learning uh, to teach these students who are disengaged that I find holds the key to, to educational success and some students have a disability, some have survived traumatising events uh, and others are not taught at home about the significance of learning. It is about circumnavigating the negative student behaviour before it gets out of control and before it creates a culture that you don't want in your class or in a year group or in the whole school. Uh, and I've seen that happen uh, a number of times uh, where I've been working in different places. Um, what I find is that building rapport is key. I will outline in this talk um, how I build rapport and, and then how I, how do you sort of use that rapport to further create student engagement. And if you already feel you have a handle on rapport and where it can take you and your students then please, I hope this talk encourages you to train others by your own example so that they may be inspired to build uh, that rapport where they can as well. So, first. Be a role model. Act the way you would like the students to act. Take responsibility for the emotional feelings that belong to yourself. It is, it's the easiest thing to do once you, once you kind of 
connect all of that. How do, I, how do you do this when you are bombarded with perhaps swearing and non-compliance and general rudeness? When you're feeling quite affronted after the fifth time this student has sworn at you that day or that week or even in the same class period, um, what can you do? How can you keep calm and keep going so that you can be the teacher that you need to be for the, all the students in your class um, still? So I'm, I'm sure you have all heard of the reptilian part of the brain called the amygdala. Uh, it is responsible for the emotions and the fight, flight or freeze uh, instincts that we rely on to survive. However, when stress and accumulative stress builds up over time, our amygdala may be running at a higher level, of course, uh, and it makes you feel like you need to be protected more um, a lot of the time uh, and more extremely. So students feel this sense as well when they have had a traumatic experience in their lives and of course so do adults. So how can we relax and keep ourselves flowing and, and moving through our day in order to, um, to teach our students and help them when they particularly need to, to be calm? Acting cognitively during the heat of the moment when you have really had enough will help you to gain perspective. Give yourself a moment, and you may only have a few seconds in that moment, um, but ask yourself something. Is this my stuff or theirs? If you can separate out a little bit to whose stuff belongs to whom and, and who will be able to perceive better, oh sorry, you will, be, you will be able to perceive better and understand fully that this moment is about them because you're the teacher and, and they are the student that needs your support. They're the kid, they're the young one. Make it about them and remember that we are here to teach them and, and sometimes students need a lot of support before we can teach them anything, as we know. Talk to the student who may be delivering such vile, hatred words to you and talk in a way that is calm and that appears to have no judgement uh, or emotional strain attached to your needs or wants. Definitely have boundaries, though, and set these in your classroom. Give extra support, uh, oh, sorry, get extra support from executives and make sure there is follow-up as well. I think that's one of the key things, um, is to make sure that your executives are all over what's happening and if they're not, then perhaps, you know, rally around and, and get higher again because that is key to um, culture in a school. Um, so what is your stuff? Learn to deal with your own grief and then act accordingly. And you could gain support from counsellors, of course, and superiors uh, if you needed. Wellbeing is about giving yourself a regular feel-good session, um, one that really helps you to let it go, it's outside of school probably, just to let it go, <laughs> do something that you really like. Whatever it is that makes you feel great about doing, uh, about, Whatever it is you feel great about doing, give yourself time to do it and your will, well-being will win. I think I've missed a slide somewhere, but no, I haven't. I'll just stay there. Okay, so once you have reflected on your stuff and then have a few great well-being times popped into your weekly routine, you can more effectively build, um, build that rapport uh, when you come back to school and build it consistently with students all of the time. Act the way you would like the students to act. You would have heard this, of course, somewhere, um, but let's put it in the context of teaching. So if, if a student's swearing at you directly, and of course you're not going to swear at them, but if they're directly at you, um, you have the choice to act or react by the way you choose to act. So this in turn is exactly what we want the students to be able to recognise and choose for themselves if we can teach it to them, <laughs> which hopefully we can. So as an example, if we choose to react, we typically engage in the anger cycle, feel hurt or defensive. Uh, anger is often shown through voice, body stance. It affects the decisions you make uh, and it can lead to outing the student and keeping them feeling defensive and this can become explosive, uh, as you've probably seen. Reacting can, uh, can see you yelling in front of the class, and that is a very easy thing to do, to get up to that level, uh, just, you know, to be um, when you're riled up. It can keep the students' amygdala working hard. Their amygdala is probably already overworked and on hyper alert, and this can lead the student to feeling that they need to take further actions to get you back 
Um, and they, there may be further attempts by the student to belittle anger or, anger or demean you and not lose face in front of the rest of the class. And worse still, this can lead to other students going along with the same attitude uh, and this can create a culture that you don't want. So remember you're not trying to win here by creating a war doing the same thing as students and I know that's very easy to, to get embroiled with. Um, it's not about who has the most power. When we choose to act, we deal with the anger by realising it's not about you, <laughs> it's about the student. They may not, not have had breakfast that morning or dinner the night before as well. Um, and in some cases, in actually quite a few cases, uh, the police might have been called to their house the night before or a family member is in some kind of trouble. The student feels anxious about that. They need the support. There's all sorts of things going on that we may never ever know about but it's quite obvious in their behaviour at school. Boundaries are good though. Have the expectations for student behaviour listed in the room uh, somewhere and use these to point to. And using nonverbal quick gestures reminds students fast without the need for getting caught into a verbal to and fro. Uh, understand the needs of the student. Discuss this beforehand with others to get a handle on various strategies um, that have worked for others or may not have worked for others. Uh, and you can try these out. Uh, find an interest in the, of the students and try to engage in non-committal, non-pressurised talk with the student but don't expect any answers from them either. It might take a while, so. In the moment where things are declining, try to circumnavigate and redirect student reactions by making a joke. Not directed at the student, of course, but by breaking the atmosphere, <laughs> it can really, um, I've seen this a lot in classes where they, they, like everybody just kind of feels a sense of relief. You can sort of feel them all going, oh. Thank goodness, you know, it's something, um, the, dr the drama has been sort of taken out of the moment, uh, which is really good. Um, and uh, make, uh, sorry, make, last thing, make the effort to decide to change, smile, but not through gritted teeth. Get happy, <laughs> if you can. Get happy, breathe deeply, and stay with that feeling of well-being that you have started cultivating within yourself and this helps you to gain perspective in the moment. It really, really does. If you are happy and, and, we, and can just kind of go in and kind of block it out in a way and just feel that happy that you felt when you were at the gym or you know, having your release session somewhere else last night, that can come into your day and really help, I find. Um, carry on as if nothing has happened. <laughs> Surprising the power in that. Say it in a tone that is non-emotional um, as remaining calm gives you the, the students the impression that you are very much in control of the situation. And it is about students' choice and it is about supporting them to make good choices. And you, you, um, you don't um, have to be part of their behaviour, um, just a safe ship to help guide them through the tumultuous seas of their journey. And at the very least, say hi the next time you see them even though that can be hard. By acting rather than reacting, you are able to better support the learning needs of the student by supporting them emotionally in the first instance. And as teachers, we are not in the business of making friends, so boundaries are definitely needed. Consider the various outcomes of when boundaries are given as a result of your anger and frustration and, your, and reacting compared to the outcomes of non-judgmental rapport that you have built over time. Uh, it puts you in the position of creating respectful interactions as you are the role model. Okay, so be approachable, be aware, be respectful, deal with your own emotions, be the person you would like them to be with you. It can take six months, six years. <laughs> It might only take six minutes. Um, if the relationship has suffered too much at this stage for any of these things to be effective, ask for mediation first with a supervisor for you and the student. That can really help. Build, build rapport and keep on building. Smile as you would to a familiar person on the street. You might say, hi, how are you? Um, how are you going? 
You don't need an answer, you just need to let them know that you want to know. So, um, you know, in six months time you might get a good or a good thanks or a, you know, half smile or <laughs> something like that. Um, and, and after another little while you may find that they are asking you, hi, how are you? It has happened, <laughs> amazingly. You can't underestimate the effects of building rapport as students feel less stressed and more able to feel confident and they show less reactive behaviour and more competencies in learning and they feel ready to learn, especially when they're walking into your classroom and they know, they just know, it's okay, now I can relax here. Once you have built rapport, you can then ask students about what they want. Ask what they, um, you know, what would really help at school and this is, this is more for a, um, you know, it could, Sorry. <laughs> How much time have we got? Ten. Oh, good, yeah, great, yeah, yeah, fantastic, awesome. I think it's on. Is that on? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. So you can't underestimate the effects. Uh, once you've built rapport, you can start asking them things that. Um, that actually really matter to them. So what would help them to want to stay at school? What, what would it be at school? You know, what's gonna get them in? What would engage them? Um, what do they need at school to make it feel safe for them? If the response is, I don't know, or nothing, or literally like they don't give you a response, Give them some time. So you can say, well, you know, I'll give you five minutes to think about it and then you can let me know. Or you could just let me know when you feel like it, meaning, you know, tomorrow or next week. Um, and without pressure, students can feel that they have a chance to consider this fairly for themselves. So um, this could be a one-on-one -on -one or a small group or a whole class exercise, depending on the dynamics of the class. Let the students have a number of chances to think about your question. Sometimes they will approach you later. It comes back to always building that rapport so that when, you know, that they can feel like they can approach you at, at any time during the school day. Intrinsic motivators help you to have an insight into their likes and be able to encourage engagement using these things that the students really like. So um, be persistent with your efforts but not over the top, not demanding, but genuine. Give students a voice. Students will have buy-in then and help them go through the process with you on how to achieve this. So once you've got a few answers and you might have, you know, a bit of a small group going that kind of, you know, want to do something or delve in and hopefully they have sort of satellite friends, the ones that are really disengaged that they can bring in. Um, this is a really good way to sort of start getting that good positive culture going. So, help them go through the process. When they, um, when they help you to help themselves and others in their peer groups, they have satisfaction and a greater sense of achievement. SRC can do this really well, but sometimes they can alienate students as well. So we've sort of, you can imagine the, the grouping of students and not everybody's into the same, you know, in the same group as the people in the SRC. So instead of the SRC, it could just be a group of kids talking um, and talking about a project that is student-centred, so what the kids want. So you could brainstorm, uh, it could be something like decorating the student engagement centre, making a small, safe, quiet space, tidying an area of a garden to become a, a student chill space, or creating excursions to the skate park. When it comes from the students, it is more likely to be of interest sustainably, of course. So students love to feel active and proactive. Students, excuse me, students feel, who feel disengaged in school can unlock great potential when they are actively doing something um, that they would like to be part of. Physically building and working on a project can relieve anxiety and help students to feel satisfaction. Feeling achievement can follow and feeling that they are part of a community, even if it is a very small group of other students, this can bring about a change in culture over time. Um, to keep it going in a positive direction, together, um, you can determine what can you do and what can students bring to the party. So, 
what can you do? Work out problem solving strategies together to get things up and running. Show students strategies and encourage them to find the solutions. I think that's an important thing. Encourage them to find the solutions. Otherwise it just, you know, it sort of becomes about you again, <laughs> which is so easy to do. Uh, it could be fundraising, getting support from assemblies um, and, and other students at assembly. Discuss spray painting, bike stays, having a picnic. It could look very different to what adults were thinking. <laughs> it could be community involvement, writing letters, liaising with service providers. It could be writing grant applications. This could be about the whole school, um, not just about the small s sort of group that you're working with. Um, and it, uh, you know, you can you know, put it up on pin boards, take it to the staff meeting, you know, all those sorts of things to get those students feeling that they've got a voice, that they can do this. Okay, answer B. Encourage students to carry out a survey. It doesn't have to be like, you know, go around with a clipboard or anything, just a general asking, you know, ask your friends, ask, ask around uh, for feedback and for further suggestions and ideas. What will give other students buy-in and want to intrinsically come to school? Students ask students for ultimate buy-in and when they begin to realise that this is for them uh, and not just another teacher-led idea, they will respond intrinsically and this uh, will create student engagement. So intrinsically motivated to learn from being able to find this place, that they're in the school, a safe and respectful place to be and that they are part of that culture. Um, and when students are feeling engaged and respected, they show signs of feeling more relaxed and grounded, better able to take things in, calm on the inside. Students want to be at school. They make more of an effort with things they don't like or don't feel comfortable with generally. Uh, is, like this thing, is this your list? Well, the students, and we'd hope it belongs to both parties. That's what I would wish for myself in a school. So what do the students respond to? Is it, in, it, it is, in my opinion, that students need a place to feel quiet or, to, or time to go for a walk to relieve tension if sitting uh, still feels too constrictive. So having the space and the activities to calm down and relax improves student focus because they can come back to a level where anxiety is reduced and the amygdala is not on overdrive so much. So students could use this space on a daily basis and circum, uh, circumvent any off-task or inappropriate behaviour by having the chance to use this space and the time as a way to regulate themselves before they feel like they want to explode. Again, ask students what they would like. By building the rapport first at every available opportunity, you know, you ask these questions. What do they like? Then add some things in that might be around things that you know they might like, that they might not have tried yet. So things like uh, drawing and, and watercolours and, and music, headphones, those sorts of things. So ask them, but also provide lots of opportunities for other activities that you, 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 know, you know that they might like. Um, and we know that finding that, that moment to sort of calm down really does have an effect on student minds. When creating a safe space, make sure that you have a range of activities, make sure your space is really, really safe, make sure there's no hard edges or cords hanging around, the placement of furniture is very important, particularly if you have students with high sensory or um, uh, needs or, or students who are going to use furniture as weapons, that's not a, not a, something very important to think about. You, you can also make this space incredibly versatile just by thinking about different areas that you have set up and making sure that those areas can kind of quickly be moved and, and changed for students when, when a new group comes in or a new student comes in to um, interact in that space. Um, find a match for both staff and students as well to, to get involved together to do things. I think um, we see a lot of... Um, uh, teachers around that you know that that student is going to be actually engaged with that teacher. Bring them in, bring them into the activity, make sure that they are feeling like they're a good match as well though and um, I think a lot of progress can happen uh, with matching the right people, to the right staff members to the right students. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit here because I know I'm running out of time but um, you can also use this as parent contact um, 
a vehicle for the student, the, the school, sorry, can report lots and lots of lovely progress with their difficult and, and challenging behaviour students to parents and this is awesome because it also creates a culture for both the students, the staff and the parents, the whole school. Um, and I think it's a really, really big one um, when you're trying to change the culture. Uh, gain training, if that, if that helps, you can um, utilise lots and lots of outreach services, perhaps um, through the community that you're in, and that can help for both staff and students and linking both staff and students into a creative project where they feel naturally able to help and even more so inspired to help is the ultimate in integrative schooling. And my last slide, which I'm gonna skip here, is have fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we'll um, keep moving on quite quickly. Our next speaker is Amanda Marshall. She teaches at John Hall. So there I was, sitting in my car, waiting for my son to finish his footy practice, and I was crying, marking my visual arts assignments. Not because they were terrible or boring, they would have been there, but because they were so meaningful, the artworks that they were making. So what I'm about to share with you in the next few minutes is how I incorporated positive education into my visual arts teaching. Now, the approach that I've been experimenting with seeks to not only develop students' artistic skills, but also the emotional and psychological skills. Now, I'm not suggesting we take this approach in every project. We need a balance. But I do think the visual arts presents a unique opportunity to develop students' emotional and psychological skills to enhance their well-being. So what is positive education? We've all heard of it. It comes under positive psychology, focusing on uh, human thoughts, feelings, and behaviours, but with a focus on strengths and building the good life rather than traditional psychology of seeking to just cope rather than actually looking at how to flourish. How often do we actually intentionally seek to incorporate these concepts into our programs? Pioneer of um, positive education, Dr. Martin Seligman, said this, the time has come for a new prosperity, one that takes flourishing seriously as a goal for education and of parenting. Learning to value and to attain flourishing must start early, in the formative years of schooling. And it is this new prosperity, kindled by positive education, that the world can now choose. Australian researchers, Noble and McGrath, who created Bounce Back, which some of you might be familiar with, created this PROSPER framework, which brings together all the positive psychology research and identifies for us as teachers what we need to do to support our students to enhance their well-being. So let's focus for a moment on the strengths element, character strengths. What if once a year, you allowed your students the opportunity to identify their character strengths and then incorporate that into an art project. In year eight, we had a fantastic animal ceramic tile project, but this time we tweaked it. The first thing we did was allow students to go onto the character strengths website, identify their top three strengths, journal their experience of their strengths, and then talk to one another about these character strengths. And then choose their animal according to what they thought would represent their character strengths. Now, that whole reflection time only took 30 minutes, but it was a beautiful introduction into the task and such a positive experience for me as a teacher and for my students to see them engaging so confidently in sharing their character strengths with one another. You know, their creativity or their love of learning or their curiosity. Um, it was really lovely. For year nine, rather than tweak an existing project, I designed a paper sculpture task where it was abstract, where students had to tell a narrative of a challenging change they had been through. So incorporating the elements and principles of art and so on and the prosper framework. So on the left, you'll, uh, oh sorry, the philosophy framework, so it, it forced them to actually think about that changed um, narrative and look at it from a positive perspective. 
recognize the outcomes, the positive outcomes, identify the strengths that they developed through that challenge, and the purpose of that challenge in their life, and also recognize their resilience as they overcame that challenge. So on the left here, a beautiful United student told the narrative of her blossoming into adolescence as she overcame low uh, body image and low self-esteem and just coming into high school and finding this new confidence. And the artwork she, she took inspiration from for texture and form is shown on the right. The next student was a year eight boy who really struggled with anxiety, telling the narrative of his struggle, uh, work, uh, having to move from his coastal hometown and move into the big bad city of Canberra. <laughs> but I cried when I had read his reflection because it made him want to celebrate when he saw his end product, because it helped him to see the joy that he had in seeing how he had overcome that challenge. So for all of these projects, I get my students to reflect on that artistic process and really ensure that they are learning to use the elements and principles intentionally and have questions like this. In year 10, I had students explore colour and composition through collage. So this time, I asked my students um, to explore a, a positive memory um, that they had had, or aspects of their personality, like their character strengths. Again, exploring the elements and principles and incorporating the Prosper framework. On the left, you have a, a boy who represented um, his character strengths um, using bunnies pack cards, and on the right, the student representing her memory of home and the love and the acceptance and the joy that she feels in that home environment. The next student you'll see that comes up uh, represents a memory that she had when she went to Yosemite Park in the US and stargazing and trying to capture both the fear and the calm that she felt in that experience. So in all of these artworks, the students are not only just focusing on that end product, but I'm seeking to use that artistic process for them to really, with the emotional and psychological skills focusing on positivity, really think of how do I represent that in abstract form. So they end up really developing a visual vocabulary that use their critical and creative thinking skills and they end up with a really personally meaningful artwork. So in a way, this sort of really isn't art as therapy, but almost art as prevention. Because you're really seeking to help students to develop those emotional and psychological skills to really set them up to flourish in life. And I'd like to quote Sandra from this morning when she said, it's easier to raise healthy people than to heal those that are broken. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And then next up we have Venice, Dr. Venus Garnas. She is a senior teacher education in Queensland, specialising in visual art education and especially in nature-based learning through visual art practice. This paper discusses a visual art practice elective inspired by social entrepreneur Muhammad Yunus's notion that each person comes with potential and much more is hidden inside us than we have had a chance to explore. Sorry, three elements have informed the motivation of this two-year project that I'm about to show, share with you. Nicklin's works, of course, as you'll see, and uh, he is in a Year 11 visual arts class that is made up of an OMG clientele. Mahalo Junis is the economist who developed the Grameen Bank, and um, it's his belief that there is poten tremendous potential in every person. The feasibility study is the third element. A past student in 2017 who designed a business model for students to develop and sell their own art pieces. This elective subject, Visual Arts in Practice, is an applied subject. Um, and it makes it easy for students to drop in. And it's also seen as a soft option elective. In a belief in the tremendous potential of each student. These students all have something that is unique. 
Although Professor Yunus was referring to the possibility of a poverty-free world, however, this can be aligned with bringing meaning and value to one's life. De Bono said the creative idea must have value. The provocation is what sets off creative thinking and steers the creative process with students as active participants in directing value and meaning to their learning. Also, my interest in the Reggio Emilia educational philosophy, although early learning focused, embraces three core principles, the child, the environment, and the teacher. It values experiential learning in relationship-driven environments. Uh, last year, emphasis was on developing skills and techniques, investing in knowledge of process while still following the unit plan. The curriculum in visual arts in practice is a two-year, seven-unit program and approved study plan which outlines a range of engaging and community-focused units of work. It is more about relationship building and creating environments to discover the limits of our potential and who we are and our connections for thinking and learning. Working with support staff enables conversations to share ideas, opinions, putting forward our perceptions and observations of students. Um, it is a question of together understanding the best way of respecting individual differences. Expertise and respect for process was also demonstrated by a ceramic mosaic artist who presented a six-week ceramic workshop a ceramic mosaic workshop and during this time Jane was also working on a number of commissions and she was able to employ four of our students during this time to assist her in her studio. Jane's father passed away early last year and I was pleased to have Jane's mother Barbara join us for several sessions. I found her presence and relationship with the students to be invaluable not only in sharing her knowledge but also sharing in conversations with the students. Planning, persistence and resolution, each component adds to the success of the project, embedding a way of working and repeated modelling of the inquiry learning process to plan, develop, make, reflect, rework. It is in providing a realistic context that a worm's eye view enables you to really see things. And according to Eunice, a bird's eye view creates um, an in enormous distance between students and the reality of life. The whole process is also about modelling the life skills. Mazzano's productive habits of mind is focused on persistence, striving for accuracy, managing impulsivity, and in 2019, this year, applying past knowledge to new situations with the making and exhibition of their artwork. Planned outcomes for the ceramic mosaic work of these domes that the students um, made last year was not realised due to the new building works and the demolition of this stone wall. But the students were so thrilled to take their pieces home when they couldn't be placed in this wall. Meeting the criteria of the set work program, the painting unit introduced students to mixed media and painting applications with layering techniques and a diversity of ways of seeing the same problem. Aware of different ways of seeing, Via Vecchi in Art and Creativity referred to this as a dance between cognitive, expressive, rational and imaginative in the learning, in the processes of learning. And ways of seeing more deeply, noticing more sensitive observations and an aesthetic acumen, a wow, a wow moment. When in this slide, the student added this text right at the top in the middle and was so proud to show me. And it had meaning for the student in the selection and placement, but also for the teacher observing and interpreting the student learning to know them better, to hold them in esteem and to grow better. The printmaking techniques in this final unit examined popular culture and added to their skills in preparation to develop and make and sell their own artworks this year. 
It's hard to explain the photo emulsion and reduction print processes, but when it happens and the final cut and the lino print colour comes in, it was a wow moment for the students. Business Management Feasibility Study by Jessica Proctor, a Year 12 student in 2017, focused on an art program for students to develop and sell their own art pieces. What could your students do with $20? $20 Boss is an immersive entrepreneur program for secondary students to, uh, that is offered through the Foundation for Young Australians to bring curriculum to life and thus the focus of our program in 2019. There are profound moments when young people bring family and friends into the gallery. Valuing the arts and the importance of a visual art education is taking into account the aesthetic dimension in learning as not being superfluous. A belief about the importance of knowledge and the emotions associated with knowledge and new situations with the role of the gallery in the final stage of our project this year. Thank you for listening. <laughs>